Thank you for joining us today on 10 Minutes with the Artist, an episodic series that explores the art practice and personal vision that guides artists. On today's episode, we're very proud to have Isabella Cruz Chong, who exhibited her recent artworks at the Juried Taking Issue exhibition at North Dakota State University's Memorial Union Gallery. Isabella will be joining us today via Skype from Brooklyn to speak about Exhale, a documentary about the installation Line of Breath on a border wall between Mexico and the United States. Exhale brings to life an inert but divisive object that has been an icon of separation, distrust, and frames the very lives and relationships of the peoples of two nations. I'm Anthony Ferris, and this is 10 Minutes with the Artist. <laughs> with the artist. You mentioned in your documentary um, that the sound is giving life to the fence and I felt like the fence could maybe be capturing the like energy and exhaustion of people trying to climb it or um, I felt like uh, maybe even like the uh, the fence came to life by itself in some sort of like magical realist way. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about how the sound gives life? Um, well, I think in order to answer that, I should explain that at the beginning, when I was when I was working on this project, I didn't know it was going to be a site-specific installation using the actual fence. For me, it never started. It grew up later to include the stories and the people that have caused the fence that are trying and that the other people that live around it. But at the beginning, the project was about my identity and an exploration city and how I grew up crossing the border every day, going to high school in San Diego, living in Tijuana, and feeling that, I was, that my identity is in some sort of liminality, a liminal space and in between, and me trying to manifest giving life this liminal space, which it made her, it showed that if there is a physical place that would be that, it would be the actual fence. So that's how I end up giving life, the actual breath, which is life, mm -hmm. to the fence, and that is my breath. I was kind of curious what you what you feel like the difference is between uh, a fence that divides neighbors and a fence that divides countries. Well, I think the difference is all on us. And that's something that I try to talk to and try to, I do my best to attempt to say this through my project is that the fence on itself is the same, is the same physically. I mean, if we get into details, of course, there's going to be some that has openings and doors, some that don't. But in general, I say it would help a lot if everyone starts seeing as a fence as just a tool and we give power to it. So for example, in the people that are living in San Diego by the fence or in Tijuana by the fence, um, that fence is not going anywhere. That fence we know what it's doing, but the way that we see the other side, whichever other side, and the way we see that fence is completely up to us. Um, so we can see the other not as something bad, not as something scary, not as something uh, anything, and and we can see it as take it as this is what it is, but I can choose to see it. Um, I can give more power to it or not, and that is ultimately up to me. Yeah. There's a, like a physicality to, um, um, to the fence that, you know, it's incredibly solid, you can't see through it, right? Um, it's much taller than the human form. Um, I mean, it does what it sort of means to do. Um, um, can you talk a little bit about the sort of like the physical nature of creating something that is so divisive? Yeah. I mean, I grew up seeing that fence, and for me growing up, I remember driving by it, and 
and it was awful and it's ugly and I didn't want to see it and you kind of like look the other way or you see past it you try to not see it or I would try to follow see like what what pictures they were covering um another thing I should point out is that the fence in Tijuana so throughout two countries in Mexico the fence is all, it's not always physically like that so and in Tijuana most of the most of the city, it, it has that fence that you're looking at. But for example, in the beach, um, you can see the other side pretty well. You can see half and half. So it's just posts, like wooden posts or metal posts. And it's beautiful there because you have water coming in and coming out in the sand. And all the animals that go through it. Uh, but the fence, the ones that I chose to work in, I chose it because it's the cavalry. And yes, you can barely see the other side. And if you see the other side, you see the wire um, so people, because there's a second wall after it. So you see the wire, so it's even more scary. You don't, there are tiny holes between the panels where you can like look out a little bit. Mm. And and you see, you, you see like the streets where the border patrol um, passes and you see nothing like a no man's land it's really not like it's not nice at all and and, and another thing i should point out is that this fence it's made up of um landing mats that were used at the vietnam vietnam war really so uh there were um, they made all this panel for planes to land on i believe it was the vietnam war and they were very heavy and they didn't click together well they couldn't assemble them very well it was tricky so i don't know if they shipped them back people don't really know they don't know if they shipped them back they were already here in the US. but there were some sort of recycle and they were a gift to me to become later the part of the fence yeah so the material itself is it's supposed to be flat, it's not supposed to fence, it's supposed to be flat, it's supposed to put a slant on it, and I think I'm always doing um, the opposite completely, I'm stopping it, and and the the material itself has a memory, and this memory of war and conflict, and it's just dislocated from its original purpose. But at the end, and both of the situations and the struggle come from the same fear of the other. Yeah, you know, with those sorts of objects, if you put those things down and you built plants like on top of it and you had a garden, then it would repurpose it into something that was different. But it's not that different, you know, like it's become something um, that separates, you know, like humanity in a way. Um, so it sort of summons that feeling of the war and it... Um, it becomes powerful in a really bad way, you know? Yeah, yeah, very easy. Um, so, uh, what do you think that the ear does that the uh, the eyes haven't in relation to this wall? Uh, it's a good question. I think is we're so, everyone, including me, is that we're so visually driven um, and triggered by it. And I think through the other senses, touch, hearing, uh, we're able to find uh, more information or another kind of information if we start paying attention to ghosts. So that was a big part of the project at the beginning. Um, and it does, for example, sound just the essence of what sound is. It, doesn't, it really doesn't have boundaries. So you cannot stop it with a physical, with a visible fence or wall so the sound can go through it and for me the sound and since it is a breathing sound gives some sort of uh how to call it like like space within the wall if that makes sense that's how i see it and and for someone when i was doing my research someone was telling me how they also encountered the same mexico u.s fence not in tijuana but in another in another town and they they knew that on the other side of the fence there was i believe like a big flea market or some um 
like sellers. So even before her eye could see the actual thing, she started hearing all the sellers in the market. So in a way, like the sound was the first sign of this fence of this wall before even seeing it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's interesting. And, and in Tijuana, it doesn't, I mean, the, it depends on what area you're talking about. In that area where I was, it was obviously is it's what you see because there's nothing else there. Like I said, it's like a no man's land. In other parts of the city in Tijuana, you know the fence is close by, the wall is close by, because there's a huge line of cars trying to cross to the other side every day. The people do um, like three hours of line to cross to the other side because they're going to work. So, um, so that wall actually made traffic uh, very bad in the city. You know that it's there because all this already like chaotic in the streets. One well, thing that I saw during the uh, during the documentary was that people stopped to ask you what you were doing and why you were there. But I felt like some of them were asking you because they were worried about your safety. And I was curious if you felt like the wall was a dangerous place to be beside. Yeah, at the beginning I thought so. And where I grew up was the, was the little town by the beach. So I grew up knowing that fence, the one that I was telling you about, that where you can see the other side. The place is a park, so it's very peaceful and very beautiful in its own way. I've never had been that physically close to the other fence that you've seen in the video. So I was a little bit scared, nervous, because one, I haven't lived in Tijuana since maybe 80 years, around 80 years. So I haven't been back there to live, just to visit. Um, I also didn't know who was around, what was the neighborhood like. I didn't know that people were going to start rude to me or start saying like, they didn't like it that I was there, that I was doing that. Like sometimes I wonder if they still consider me part of Tijuana or not. So all of these questions I have that are very personal. Um, but when I got there, uh, yes, at the beginning I was kind of like conscious of where was my car, where is my stuff, because in Tijuana I always remember that. I always leave my stuff in the car and I have to lock it, lock it so it doesn't get stolen, things like that. So I was very careful with that. And then after like maybe two, three hours, uh, people started asking me because they were curious and if they can help and they want to help, they'll do it. And the guy, the taxi driver that you see in the video, he offered me his Ford extension. He offered me maybe to get um, the, like to plug it there for the speakers. I ended up plugging my project through the restaurant that was literally across from it. Um, and everyone was very friendly. Um, like he says in the video, I never went down towards that part where he told me not to go. So I didn't go there. But where I was always at, it was really nice. And then I went once in January to test everything. And then I went again on April to do the installation. And I went back, when I went back in April, it was really good to be back. I kind of like, made this like intimate I feel like I did this like intimate relationship with the fence or kind of made peace with it um in a way that I've never had before like I don't like it but it also it's part of who I am and and I appreciate it for what it is in a weird way that's what I'm trying to figure out yeah um, um. thank you that was that's beautiful um one thing that we try to do at the very end of our um our interview is uh, maybe talk a little bit about your creative process. So I just have a few questions about sort of uh, um, your sort of personal style. So what time of day do you feel like you're most creative? Depends. Uh, creative when the time of day when I get like these like kind of sparks of ideas of or just like keywords is is usually when when you're in the middle of uh, awake and going to sleep. <laughs> That's when sometimes I need to like stand up and just write something well I don't I'm not, I don't look at anything I just like write it down and then go to back to sleep um that's those kinds of creative ideas um and when I when I do everything when I start doing the prototypes and the tests 
is usually in the afternoon or at night. Okay. It's late afternoon, yeah. Uh, do you listen to music or uh, the radio while you're um, making work? I do. I listen to music and uh, sometimes it's even like my guilty pleasures, but it's, it's whatever it will help me to almost forget about the music and forget about where I am and just focus on the project. And if I'm doing a very personal project, which has been uh, like in the last couple of years, I'll usually pick the songs that remind me of that experience or that place. So I can also emotionally go back to that. Uh, are you reading anything right now? Mm, am I reading any? I'm reading uh, Patty Smith's second book, The M Train. Okay. Uh, what do you think the most challenging thing is about working in the medium that you're working in? Well, I think the question is like my medium right now would be is it sound? Is it dirt? Is it site specific? I, I don't know. I think it's all of them and I'm still exploring which one when. Um, but I can talk about site specific work, which is. I'm very interested in, in social engaged art. And what I think is complicated about it is, for example, when I was selling this project at the Fed, and you can see it in the video, um, I was test the, the speakers and I was putting them on and listening to them, checking that they work. And at the same time, you see two guys at the end also listening, but they're not listening to the fence or listening through the fence. And then at the end, we found out that they had jumped. Mm -hmm. And we never noticed. Anyone who was there never noticed. I'm kind of embarrassed about it. Like, here I am doing this project, talking about the fence and the two sides. And I'm there installing, and I don't see anything. So, for example, that is, I think, one big challenge when it comes to science-specific work. Um, who are you doing it for, and why are you doing it? And, um, yeah, I think those are very, I mean, I don't have the answers, yeah. but I think that that's the tricky part when it comes to site-specific work. And then I guess my last question would be, uh, what's next for you? Um, right now I'm reading, searching a lot. I'm reading also about a uh, family constellation and I'm reading, um, and I'm writing a lot and sketching. And I think, I think where I'm going to, I, I when I finished this project, it was either I was going to keep working with this physical boundaries and travel and meet them and see other type of physical boundaries, not the one that I grew up in, um, or go to more virtu virtual boundaries. And I think that's kind of where I'm leading to, but right now it's too broad. And once you start seeing boundaries and the other, I mean, it's everywhere. So I'm reading and I'm meditating to see what a specific thing about virtual boundaries, either in relationships or in oneself, I'm interested in, and and that's where I'll go next. Okay. Well, perfect. Well, uh, thank you, Isabella. Um, I'd like to thank our guest, Isabella, and I'd also like to thank you for your time and your interest in the professional practice and creative explorations happening here at North Dakota State University. So thank you, and for everyone here at the Memorial Union Gallery, keep creating.